Hi, I'm Alex Vincent. Welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. Welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. Best subscribe to the Sarah O'Connell Show. Otherwise, Chucky will kill you. Alex Vincent, welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. How are you today? I'm doing excellent. How are you? I'm really good. Thanks. Very excited to talk to you and celebrate your amazing career. First of all, I want to get started with, of course, you are an actor, but can you tell me what you aspire to be growing up? I understand that you got interested in acting at a very young age. Yeah, I did. I mean, I was five years old when I, when I started um, acting. And when I went on my first audition, I was five and really started getting going when I was six. Um, so at the time, I mean, I, I was just excited to be on TV. I wanted to see myself in a commercial or something like that. I saw my neighbor in a commercial. And I thought that was the super cool thing, someone I knew in person on TV. Um, so really the aspiration was only that. Um, mm. the, the rest of this, how it all kind of caught up with after the Chucky film, like uh, really took me by surprise. I, I didn't exactly know, I don't think at that age, what I was walking into. I understand that filming started in the fall of 1987 for the original Child's Play, but can you tell me what the audition process was like? How did you even hear about the film and how did you end up auditioning for what was a horror film? Well, I had a manager in New York City that mm. was sending me out on all kinds of things. So it was just another audition that came through her. And uh, yeah, this one was a horror film, but you know, there was all kinds of stuff I auditioned for from soap operas to commercials to uh, you know, everything that kids my age in the 80s in New York City were getting called for, uh, I was auditioning for. And so the film shot in Chicago and it was obviously very cold and you were, I believe, six years old at the time. What was the environment on set like? Did they kind of protect you from all of the, the gory stuff? I mean, the, the truth is I was a very bright kid and they knew that. Um, and, I, and I had a really good acting coach and I, I knew what was going on. I knew that the objective was to uh, make the audience scared with what we were doing. Uh, that didn't mean that I was scared, but it meant right. that was our goal was to make them scared. Uh, and I understood that concept. Um, so they didn't really hide all that much from me. Like in Child's Play 1, when, when the melted burnt Chucky after I burned him in the fireplace was stalking me down the hallway. They thought that was maybe a little too gruesome. So I think right. I don't think they put that doll in front of me to see it. I personally didn't want to see uh, Ed Gale on fire. So I didn't have to see that. Um, but other than that, everything else, you know, if I'm sharing the screen with it, it happens. If it happens, right. if it cuts back to someone else, there's a chance I wasn't there. Now, one really interesting thing that I didn't know to start with was that an actress called Jessica Walter originally was going to voice Chucky and recorded all of the dialogue. And it wasn't until they got to test screenings that they found out it wasn't quite working. And that's when they hired Brad Dorif to do the voice, the legendary voice of Chucky. Did you ever hear Jessica's original performance? I did not. And that's the first time I've ever heard that in my life. Already? Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, I, I didn't know that either. And I checked it at multiple sources. And apparently the idea was that an actress had voiced the demon in The Exorcist and they wanted to get an actress to voice Chucky, who originally was going to be more of an electronic sort of sounding voice or something. Well, that's just a credit to what a good researcher you are, because uh, <laughs> I didn't know any of that. So interesting. Yeah, and I, I guess if that kind of thing was put in, in post-production anyway, it wouldn't necessarily have been played on set. While you're sure. filming it. Yeah. 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 You say that you didn't see all of the, the gory scenes and people on fire and stuff like that. When did you first watch the completed film? What age were you? When it came out, I, there was no delay that the, I was at the premiere. Uh, we, we, well, we had a premiere in New Jersey. Um, yeah. I was so excited to see what it would look like. Yeah. You know, our perspective on set was not anything near what it looked like in the film. So yeah, I was super excited to see it. My, Grandfather rented out uh, the uh, cinema up near my house and uh, we had all of our friends and family come to it. And I was in a tuxedo and I stood there and signed autographs, my first autographs for everybody. And uh, yeah, there was there was no, you know, I, I'm, I, 
I taught myself how to read basically with that first script. I had the whole lo- see the whole script memorized, all my lines, mm-hmm. all everybody else's lines, um, to the point where if someone ad libbed a little bit, I was like, "That's not the line," <laughs> and they had to like tell me, "No, it's okay." Um, so yeah, I was I was uh, <clears throat> was very aware of what we were doing. I was not really protected from much, and nor did I need to be, you know. One thing I was wondering when I was watching the film, so the the original setup is that Charles Lee Ray, the serial killer, goes into a toy store, transfers his soul into Chucky. I wondered what would have happened if instead of his life ending in a toy store, if it was instead like a grocery store and he ended up possessing a demonic loaf of bread or something. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, an evil pumpkin or something. Yeah, 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 that would have been interesting. (laughs) And I don't think we would have gotten seven films in a TV series out of that idea, but could have been interesting. It's very true. And so how long after shooting the first Child's Play were you approached about doing a sequel? Did they wait to see how it did at the box office? I don't really remember that. Yeah, We made the next one only like a year and a half later or something like that. So it probably wasn't long, but I have no idea when. And did you feel pressure in the sequel because it was a huge film? You're returning to this character that wasn't unknown at this point. Everyone knows who Andy Barkley is. Did you feel that pressure being the, the leads in a film? The answer is yes. Um, when, when I was six and I made the first one, there was no pressure. I, I was very young. It was just all fun. Uh, but I was eight and I'm very mature eight at that when we were making part two. And I knew that the first one was a success. I knew that Andy had gone through some serious trauma. I knew that he really missed his mother. I knew that um, the fans wanted uh, to see more of this character in Chucky. I knew it was successful. Um, So yeah, I did feel, I did feel some pressure to really be good, uh, you know, to do a good job. And the original was filmed on location in Chicago, but the, The sequel was filmed at the Universal Studios lot. How much fun was that for you as a kid to be there? Did you get to explore to see any other films being filmed while you were there? Even better than that, Sarah. I was at that age um, obsessed with Marty McFly, as most kids my age were. And Don Mancini took me in his Blue Alpha Romeo to the movie theater and we watched Back to the Future 2. And this is while they were filming Back to the Future 3 right. on the same lot because they came out right one after another. Um, and I I mean, I'm pretty sure that, that he took me to see part two. It couldn't have been part one, but he took me to the movies to see Back to the Future. And we uh, I, I was able to walk through the whole back lot of the, the Back to the Future set. I sat in the actual DeLorean and I had lunch with Michael J. Fox in his trailer. Crazy. Um, when I was eight years old, wow. uh, you know, it was, yeah, it was, um, it was, it was a remarkable experience. That's incredible because yeah, the, the set is still kind of there, isn't it? With the clock tower. And cause I've been on the universal studios tour myself. Yeah. My memory is that he took me to see back to the future too. I, I, you know, I know he took me to the movies in his car mm-hmm. and, uh, and I, I'm pretty sure it was back to the future too. Cause he, he knew I was such a huge fan of it. And, uh, and yeah, that was just the first of many uh, really cool experiences that I've gotten in my life because of Don Mancini and this Chucky films. That's amazing. And so recently I also had the opportunity to interview Christina Elise and we chatted about the films as well. What was she like to work with? Christine was great. I mean, mm-hmm. Christine um, was having so much fun on set. You know, she was really just having a great time. Uh I think it was one of her first bigger things, you know? So, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was super fun. We bonded immediately. Uh, there was chemistry between us as human beings, uh, immediately. And certainly the same goes for Don and I, and, and I think that's why three decades later, we're still as close as we are. So you must have a different perspective on the films to an audience because you lived through them looking back on the first two movies what are your favorite scenes be it either to to film or just to watch back as anytime anytime i get to hurt the doll is super <laughs> fun for me they're fun to film uh you know uh andy was a bit of a badass even back then you know or at least he wasn't too scared he was a pretty tough kid um 
so yeah, any any of the time that I got to do some damage was always fun. They were so much fun. And I I grew up in the 80s. I think we're the same age. I think I'm about four months older than you. And especially the second film, I absolutely loved it. But at the time, though, in the 1980s, there were so many horror films that came out. Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, Halloween, Gremlins, you know, it could go on forever, yeah. Lost Boys. Yeah. What do you attribute to Child's Play and Chucky's lasting success? How has it survived this long? There's a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, um, the, the concept of this film taps into the inherent fear that so many people have to begin with of their inanimate dolls coming to life and trying to kill them. This was a fear that they, their imagination as a child put in their head before we ever did. Yeah. Um, so there's that connection that people felt to it. Add on top of that, uh, Brad's incredible performance, Kevin Yeager's incredible puppeteering work, the great direction, the great writing. And, uh, and you know, the charming, incredible, deviously disturbed, yet very charming performance by Brad Dourif. Uh, you know, it, it made Chucky uh, hateable and lovable from the very start. And I was a pretty cute kid. I think that maybe helped a little bit. <laughs> and so the, the third film was released only nine months after the second, which is incredible, even for the 1980s when there was about 400 police academies. But yeah. Andy Barkley had aged by eight years and there was a new actor playing him, Justin Whalen. How did you feel at the time? Because obviously you'd been the lead in these two movies and then someone else had taken over. They couldn't have aged you, I suppose, eight years, but why, yeah. do you know why it was necessary to age the character by eight years or? Uh, I, th I think, I think they just felt like that they had explored Chucky with a child as much as they wanted. They wanted to jump ahead to right. give uh, Andy a, a love interest and be in military school and stuff like that. But to answer your question about how I felt, the answer is devastated. Mm. I was crushed or, or gutted it, as you guys say on the other side. <laughs> uh, I was, I was crushed. Yeah, I was, I was, uh, it was very difficult. It was very difficult. And, and it continued to be difficult seeing the success of Bride of Chucky and Seed of Chucky. And, you know, it was before the days of social media and I didn't know how to continue talking to Don or anything like that. Uh, yeah. And, and it was just, you know, it's just such a blessing that later in life we got to reconnect and, and make some more amazing things happen together. Yeah, because you, of course, you reappeared in the curse of Chucky's post credit scene. How did yeah. that come about? Were you hesitant to return to that world that you'd left decades before? Or were you excited to get back to Andy? Well, that this, that's kind of a difficult question because... I was hesitant to get more attention. I was hesitant to step in front of the screen again. I was hesitant to, you know, I, I, I didn't, I wasn't forced out of acting, you know, it wasn't like I just like started sucking at it and couldn't get work. And like, I just didn't want to do it. Like I didn't want the attention anymore. When sure. I, was a kid, I, I, as you get older, you become more insecure. And I was realized I was much more of an introvert and, right. um, I just didn't want to do it. I didn't want to audition, especially. That was really just starting to crush me. And especially as a child up there, like you would go to school all day and then have to sit in the car in traffic to drive through the Lincoln Tunnel into New York City and all that traffic. And like, instead of playing baseball and hanging out with my friends and stuff, I was memorizing lines. And like, I mean, I started working at five years old. Right, yeah. So, so by about 12, I was just burnt out and left. But uh, I mean, I always enjoyed acting. It was the industry that was just too much for me at the time. Um, and, you know, I, I started doing conventions and I started meeting fans and I, I became a little more comfortable in embracing uh, this very cool thing that happened when I was younger. And that gave me the confidence, along with just the thrill of reconnecting with Don and the opportunity to work with him again. Um, because I mean, I love that, that man so much, like he's changed my life. Uh, he continues to change my life all the time. Um, and, uh, 
you know, I, I was just, I was just thrilled to do it for him. And I was thrilled to do it for the fans that had been so good to me at all these conventions and so kind and so appreciative. Um, so whether I was nervous or anxious or needed to get on a diet right away or needed to get my head straight to do something like this, um, there was no real hesitation. It was too, too, too fun of an opportunity and, and too, I felt too appreciative of both the fans and Don to, to not do it. So I was so delighted to see you appear at the end of that film. As I say, I love the films in the 1980s. I continued watching them, but the originals were always my favorites. And I was wondering too, so in that scene, you uh, sent a box and you open it, put it on a table in your kitchen, and then you, you take a call to your mom and then you see Chucky breaking out of the box. And then in the next shot, you're ready with a gun and you shoot him. But does that suggest that either Chucky was relentlessly trying to get Andy for his entire life, or does it mean that Andy was just in a constant state of readiness just in case Chucky ever came back? What was your interpretation of that? The way I take it is that is that Andy was just... Um... I think this was so traumatic for him, all of this, uh, that he never stopped thinking about Chucky every day of his life. He, he never really believed that Chucky was dead, no matter what happened. Um, I take it back to the first film as I'm after we shoot him in the heart and they're backing me out of the room and the door closes and freezes on my face. That image to me is very powerful and it, and it it really means that you know this isn't over not by a long shot and now 34 years later uh the impact of that shot is even stronger because you know it wasn't over you know he told me we'd be friends to the end in 1988 and he was not kidding um there's very few friendships like that these days is there so i mean well, we have a we have a very complicated friendship, <laughs> Chucky yeah. and I. It's very true. Yeah. And so in that same scene, as I mentioned, you're on the phone to your mum. So does that suggest that she's sort of back out in society now? You're talking about going to a party, perhaps. Where do you think she's at? At that part, I really don't. I don't know. I I we, I would just improvise a couple lines um, about that. You know, Don said it would. You know, it would be funny. Like you know, you're calling your mom, so say some things like that was just like all improv really um the stuff i was saying on the phone so i didn't know real thought went into it then and uh i mean maybe he was thinking about it, it was his idea to tell me to say something like that you know but the it was not scripted stuff it was just stuff that we kind of came up with sure like that. and then say so you're having had this cameo at the end of that film for Cult of Chucky, your role was expanded even more. The film opens with you, you're on a date and your date has Googled you and knows your entire history. Do you think that Andy's childhood is something that's just been carried around with him his entire life? He can't escape it at this point, especially with the internet. Yes, and as has mine. <laughs> it's very true. You know, we have a lot of parallels. Uh, if I meet someone and they Googled me, they can learn a lot about me or, <laughs> or they already know it or they know it coming into meeting me. Um, you know, Chucky, Chucky was not a trauma of my childhood, but, you know, when you do something like that and it changes your life that much, it changes the life of your family, it, you know, and not changed in the way that like we're super rich and we moved to Hollywood. It was never like that. I never got paid enough money to change our lives. Right. It, it was not like that but it changes you in the attention that you receive from people, it changes you in the way people look at you. It changes you in the way that your family and friends look at you. I mean, mm -hmm. usually they're all great. So, I mean, for the most part, it was good, but there's, there's all kinds of things. There's, there's envy. There's uh, some jealousy towards it. There's a feeling of maybe I'm being condescending and arrogant to people when I'm really never meant to be, yeah. but you know, oh, you're a big shot movie star. You know, there's, there's, um, there's a reason why child actors who are forced into not forced, but go into some direction like that when they're young, there's a re reason why so consistently they struggle to find happiness and they find ways to escape 
um, escape the attention, escape the um, the the self reflection, the uh, the 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 feeling of like, how do I top this? What do I what do I do next in life? Like, why don't I have any money? And everybody thinks that I'm such a big deal, you know? Yeah. Um. So yeah. So it, my my childhood was not like Andy's, thank God, but it was, it was very parallel to his experience in the fact that it affected me, you know? So when, to go back to your question, I mean, when we were making Cult of Chucky, um, I, I thought that that idea of him, you know, I had a conversation with Don a few years before that, and where I said, it would be really great if Andy spent the next few years just torturing the shit out of him, kept him alive and tortured the shit out of him. And Don, who is uh, very gracious in his acceptance of some of my ideas and his, you know, that's really, and I don't know if he knows that there was a conscious, I don't know if he had a conscious thought when he wrote it, that we had that conversation, but I planted a seed because when I got the first script, that's what, what it was about. And that's exactly where I wanted Andy's character to go. It's the only thing that made sense to me. Yeah. Um, uh, cause he is a little damaged and, and, you know, I have that date and then we go back now, this is, you know, Don's brilliant writing and, and filmmaking is that I have that date and I'm trying to kind of plead my case of like, you know, I, you should date me. I'm okay. I'm not that bad. And then I go home and people see that Andy's pretty fucked up. Mm. Yeah. Um, and, and to me that honestly, that's the, that's the, only reasonable progression for the character i think that you know he has a, a disconnection from the world in his head because he's constantly tormented by memories and fears and worries and and vengefulness and and uh and he doesn't want others to go through this and mm. i think he feared that chucky would still be out there and when he found out he was it, it, he kind of snapped a little bit yeah, and I guess in one sense, it must have almost been like a kind of therapy for him, having survived Chucky twice. And then also because he mentioned at one point that Chucky really doesn't like fire. He's also just finding out what he responds to. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I, I don't spend too much time interpreting what would happen outside of the stuff that is shot. I mean, a little bit, but, you know, yeah. um, like wide views of things i don't really focus too much on the details but i do think that uh the time that he spent with chucky he learned a lot he learned a lot of things i mean he he i think there were nights where they were just talking i think there were nights where andy was getting information out of him i think there was i think we all know chucky likes to talk and has a lot to say um you know, I, I think I think he knew, you know, like in Cult of Chucky, when Tiffany calls him and, and instantly Andy says, I know who you are. Mm. He knows who he is because he's been talking to Chucky for four years and getting all these pieces of information out of out of him possible. You know, that's how he knows who she is. And, and I think that that uh, is the case for a lot of things um, that Chucky has in his head, head, unhanded. It's interesting, too, because, of course, as you mentioned, they spoke for four years. You don't know if Andy knows how to do voodoo now or anything. So it leaves it quite wide open as to what could happen. I see you're, you're already trying to write season two in your head. I, I've uh, been up to we'll season stay. five already. It's incredible. <laughs> Highly recommend you it. <laughs> you never know. And so later in that movie, Andy gets himself committed because he can't talk his way into the the building and not only that but he manages to smuggle a gun inside a short-haired chucky doll yes what do, what do you think his plan was he wanted to speak to nika but she had been possessed at that point was his plan to get nika out was it just to try and kill chucky uh, i think he was aware that there were multiple chucky dolls there uh i think he did want to help nika i think he saw what was happening to her and what happened to her family and mm. you know he does have a bit of uh justice about him he wants he doesn't want chucky to get the upper hand on anyone you know um he takes it very personally if he does um so i think he he did go there and as far as his practical plan yeah i think he his plan was to smuggle in a gun because he knew that chucky would turn this one alive 
And, uh, or he, you know, if he didn't, it would be even easier to retrieve it, but he figured he'd need it. He'd need that mm -hmm. gun. And I will make one point. Uh, you know, I shoot the doll several times yeah. and then Nika shows up and, and I, I, uh, I, Andy turns with the gun and, tr and she says, you know, think about, you know, thinking's for loser, that whole dialogue, you kill me, you kill her, think about it. And then I just, I know what I want to do. And I shoot her. I try to sh shoot her j just to kill Chucky, which makes me think that, yeah, Andy wants to help Nika, but he really just wants to stop Chucky. I mean, that's really his goal. Mm -hmm. And, um, and for those that think, you know, Andy was an idiot for using all of his bullets on the first doll, that was supposed to be what it was intended to be, which was kind of like a throwback to the first film, the gun jams, yeah. maybe the blood from the blood from pulling him out. I got a couple of shots off and then the gun jams. Everybody's reaction to that was, oh, you used all your bullets. No, I start messing with the gun right away after it doesn't click because I know there's more bullets in there. It's supposed to keep firing. It's supposed to, you know, finish what I set out to do. But Chucky got the upper hand on Andy um, as he's one to do sometimes um and that just pissed andy off even more yeah. and then he had then he had two weeks or so to sit there in his thoughts and uh i think leading into the series andy's just completely fed up and and wants this to end once and for all and you know i think he's even kind of kind of pissed that he had to deal with all this still in his life yeah. you know um so yeah that's that's what I there was three child's plays then there was bride of chucky seed of chucky and curse and cult of chucky as well but then the series took a very odd direction in which it got rebooted in 2019 most unnecessarily uh, yeah. have you ever seen that movie what are your thoughts on it what did I've you never, think about I've, never, it? I've never seen it no I've seen it were there talks at that time about doing a tv show or did that come afterwards yes there were uh, oh, wow. we had we had intentions and plans to to do a follow-up to Cult of Chucky in the form of a TV series, yeah. That film didn't affect those plans in any sort of capacity that was concurrent project that was going to exist outside of that movie. This is kind of a polarizing topic and <laughs> say too much about it is just gonna piss some people off. Uh, and, and, you know, to the short answer to it is th that, that, uh, it did complicate things, did complicate the plans that we had. Yeah. Uh, I think the cast and the crew, um, you know, I, I wish nothing but good for them. Gabriel is a really sweet kid and I, I'm a big fan of Aubrey Plaza. And like, the, they were just taking a job. They're just doing their job. Yeah, um, the fact that the film was made, I think, I think that our fear at the time certainly is that it was going to stop us from being able to make this TV series. Mm. And I don't know, I'm not... I'm just an actor, so I don't really know the details of that. But I, I, that was, I think, the fear is that this was this is going to confuse the fan base, and it did. And this is going to cause delays and maybe make our show not even happen. And it, it did. Um, and so that's really the feeling about that. Anything beyond that, you know, I don't know. Don't have much else to say about that. That's fair enough, especially as you haven't seen it as well. And so how, can you tell me how the TV show was originally pitched to you? Was it kind of pitched as this continuation of the movies or how was it explained to you? Uh, in little, little bits at a time. Yeah. I mean, Don, Don uh, does clue me into a lot, but he also likes to surprise me, especially once he gets writing, you know, once he gets writing, I think he's just really excited for me to read it. Mm. Um, so he tells me little, little things like to get an idea, but uh I had no idea until I read the scripts. And then when I read the scripts, I was like, this is fucking amazing. This is perfect. You did it, Tom. You did it. You did what you needed to do. And fans are going to fucking love this. And, uh, you know, and then seeing it all come together he, is better than I could have ever even imagined. So uh, this is just a very thrilling experience. It was very, very fun to film. And it was uh, incredibly fun to watch week by week. 
uh, with the fans. And, and uh, it's, it was just an unbelievable thing. It led to, you know, probably the happiest and most fun year in my life in 2021. So I'm very happy to hear that. And so the, the show filmed in 2021, I understand there were some delays. How much was the production affected by the pandemic? It filmed in Toronto, I believe. How, how long were you there for? I was there for 68 days and I was on set for 11 of those days. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. The COVID mm. protocols were difficult. Uh, mm. I mean, there's, there's stuff because it's a huge production and there's SAG things and production things, but there's also Canada things and Canada was still in a quarantine situation. They were actually way behind almost everywhere in the United States as far as their reopening goes. Um, so yeah, there was uh, the the thing of that is if I'm quarantined for 14 days, it means I can't go back and forth. So I had to be there the entire time. Um, yeah. And we were tested. You know, I think at first it was five times a week. When I by the time I got there, it was three times a week. Um, 40 minutes from the apartment they had me in. Uh, so even though I was only on set 11 days, I was getting driven for COVID testing three times a week. Uh, yeah, it was, there were challenges. There were challenges for sure. I can imagine. And so can you tell me what your favorite parts of the series were, either scenes that you're in or just in general watching the whole honestly, series? Back? Honestly, there's so many parts of it that I loved. I loved all of it. I mean, that's why Christina Lee and I are starting the Chucky Talks podcast, uh, where we're going to break down every episode scene by scene and discuss in great detail what it is that we're doing uh like what it is that we did on the show and what it is that how we interpret it how possibly how don interpreted it and we're going to interview uh, all the all the everyone from the show and get their reaction and their thoughts and their interpretation of what happened i mean it's really uh we loved it we really really loved the show i feel like it got better and better each episode and um yeah there, there's so much to dissect there so much can you tell us, speaking of which, then when we might be able to listen to this podcast? Sure. Uh, there's a lot, a few things going on with that. I mean, uh, my Instagram has kind of blown up since this uh, TV series, as one mm. would expect. And I'm doing a lot of Instagram lives there. And we just set up a Patreon, my YouTube page, and we're doing a lot of preparation for it. I'm, I'm working with my fans through Patreon, through Instagram Live to come up with all the questions and all the ideas uh, there's going to be all kinds of uh, what's going to be on YouTube, but it's also going to be like the extended versions of it and, uh, you know, edited video content through our Patreon pages. Um, and yeah, we're kind of rolling out a bunch of this starting now, um, starting this past week and uh, getting ready for these interviews. And, you know, I think it's a, it's a cool thing. I mean, we all do interviews all the time, but uh to be interviewed by someone who's part of this experience with you. There's a, a familiarity and there's a little bit more of a, a connection that, you know, that we're going to get to explore with all of these amazing actors. And, and, uh, and I won't say exactly who's agreed to come on it, but all of your favorites have. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. So follow Instagram, Alex underscore Vincent, Patreon, Alex underscore Vincent. And you can search for my channel on YouTube, which is Alex Vincent, the final note is the best way to find me because, you know, YouTube doesn't really give you an easy link. Um, so Alex Vincent, the final note, which has my previous podcast, which is also coming back through my Patreon and I'm doing live streaming, live chats with people. Um, I mean, I do all kinds of things right after we're done tonight. I'm going to have a Zoom with all of my patrons and we're all going to just hang out and talk. I'm going to be rewatching the episodes with them as well to get their information and feedback. Um, yeah, I, 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 you know, this, this fan base has been so kind to me for so many years and obviously they love the character Andy, um, but they've been really, really amazing to me and I want to give back as much as I can to them. So this year I, I plan on working incredibly hard to uh, offer everything that they would want and, and make it as fun as possible in the excitement leading up to season two. And that's really great to hear. And I've checked out your Patreon already. There's a ton of content on there. So check that out. And there's a link on your Twitter as well, isn't there? So people can- There is, it. yeah. My Twitter is the same, Alex underscore Vincent. Um, 
yes, you can get to my Patreon that way. And it's really just the beginning. I mean, it's nice to say, say a ton of content. I just started. I'm mean, it's only, I've only had it going for like two weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, I have so many plans. I'm, I'm working on it all day long, uh, coming up with things. There's going to be all kinds of fun video content behind the scenes footage that I have, you know, I have 34 years of things that I've collected over the oh, yeah. years of, of, uh, photos and, and memories and stories. And, uh, yeah, for Chucky fans, there's going to, there's going to be a lot of fun stuff there. And I want to go into a couple of spoilers now. So for people that have watched all of Chucky season one, I'm going to be speaking about the ending. Now, if you haven't seen it, you're about to find out what the ending is. So, yeah, so tune out. Otherwise, yeah. <laughs> yeah. just pause this, go watch it quickly, come back. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So there's a huge explosion at the end of the final episode. It suggested that Kyle dies, but then in that final shot, we see a hand wearing a leather glove on the tree. What's your personal interpretation of that? Do you think Kyle survived? I don't know. It's very true, but what's your, what's your thoughts on it? I don't know. I don't know. I'm the anti-spoiler, Sarah. I no, 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 no. It's not a spoiler. As an audience watcher. I don't even know. want people. I don't even want people. To, I don't write for Don. So I, I don't. I can't even begin to think what's going to happen next about anything. I can't make any guesses. I can't make any uh, informed opinions. I can't. You know, this, this show was too fun to. I, I love surprising people with these shows. Absolutely. You can interp- You can interpret those things as you wish. That's all I can say about that. In which case, I know you're definitely going to answer my next question, which is there's a <laughs> there's a popular fan theory on the internet that the the teacher in the show, Miss Fairchild, could in fact be Glenda from Seed of Chucky. Is, it, is there? Is that yeah. what they think? And I know. I, I know. I hear a lot of people say that. I don't Science know. Teacher, I don't know. Sarah, I have bomb. no idea. No idea. Maybe. Maybe That's not. The spirit. <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, it's not like I'm being coy and I know no, no, no. I, I know things that I, I don't know. People can't hear that without without running with my personal opinion and, and getting more excited about it and thinking that I know something. And that I, I this is the truth. I don't know. When I do know, I'm not going to tell you. Of course. So there's no point. So there's no point in me making guesses. I, I really I really don't. Uh, I don't know, and I don't want to uh, persuade any imagination of the viewer <laughs> with my own thoughts. It's one of those funny things where I don't expect an answer, but I also feel like I have to ask. I get, I, yeah. I get it. I get it. I know exactly why you asked, but yeah. uh, I can't. Yeah, I can't. I, I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't like to answer those kind of things because so I, I can give you my interpretations of things from the past that you've yeah. seen. Giving your, my interpretation of something to come opens a can of worms that I, I don't want to even mess with. Of course. Are there any other legacy characters that you'd love to see return in future seasons, your mom or anybody else? That I'd love to see. Yeah. If, it, if it fits the story, if it fits the story and Don wants it, then I'm all about it. You know, I don't think, I don't think bringing anyone back just for the sake of bringing them back is the way to go. So I, that's that's entirely up to Don. And, and it's entirely up to those actors. Yeah. You know, people got to think about that too. You know, that it would have to be Don wants them to, the studio wants them to, they want to, and it fits the story. And then maybe, but it, you know, you can't, you can't just assume that uh, everything works just because it would be fun. Of you know? Course. Now there's, There's only few iconic characters in horror that have survived not only one, but multiple films. Sidney Prescott in Scream, for example, Andy Barkley in Chucky. Can you tell me what you think the key is to surviving Chucky? Well, Andy's just a tough kid. You know, he knows, he knows, uh, you know, he's, he's a tough, he's a survivor. I mean, there's, it also, you know, having a great relationship with the uh, writer helps. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I I don't know many characters that started as early as I did and are continuing to play the same character now. Right. I mean, I've played Andy five times now from when I was six years old to when I was 40. 
I'll give you a minute to think of anyone else who's done it that long. Uh, I can't think of any um, who have had this opportunity to come back in this way. Maybe there's, if, if there is anyone that's a handful of people ever. Um, so that's, I mean, I mean how old was she when she started in Halloween? I don't know. Younger? I mean, it, but it's, a, yeah, of course, of course. She, uh, there's several, there's several who did, but, it's not that common to, to get a chance exactly. to come back. And especially in, in this form, like where moving from uh, uh, film to TV, um, it's just an incredible, incredible thing that as a, uh, as someone who loves this franchise myself, mm. someone who understands Andy more than anyone else in the world, except for maybe Don, um, or maybe even on par with Don in that case, actually. Uh, I, I, I'm I'm just completely uh, thrilled and excited with this opportunity to do something new, something exciting, something fun, something very gratifying to the fan base that has been so incredibly kind to me personally and to everyone in our Chucky family. And I was so excited when I heard the show was coming back when did you hear that the show had been commissioned for season two when you did oh, really? uh, well, no about about 48 hours before you did yeah that's amazing and have you signed on yet no you haven't signed on yet nope very exciting do you, do you know when they have plans to start shooting season two i don't really i really don't I, I have guesses like you would, but that's yeah, it. I have no idea. I have no idea. That's something I will give you my assumptions. My, I assume that they're going to try to fit a similar schedule as last time. I would think that they'd want it to come out in the fall like it did. Of course, yeah. But I don't know. I really don't know yet. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it started shooting in March last year. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 So I don't know. I don't know if it's going to be. Uh, I have no idea yet. <laughs> Too early to tell. Very true. Have you kept any props or souvenirs or costumes from any of the productions you've worked on? I've kept a few things. I really only ever wanted a Chucky doll. That's all I ever really wanted. And I got one from Cult of Chucky. Um, the rest of the stuff, I and, and now I've, I have more dolls. I've been given dolls. Like <laughs> I like having Chucky dolls. The rest of this Chucky stuff that I have and I've collected over my life, I pretty much sell to fans because I'm not going to make a big shrine of myself in my house yeah. and it would be greater appreciated in their hands. Um, so I've been selling all kinds of things, especially recently on Instagram, but uh, uh, yeah, most of that stuff I've let go of um, at the time. Also there, there were times when I really just needed the money and that would help, yeah. but, but more, the memories are so deep in me and they're so reoccurring in my life that I don't really need a physical thing to hold on to those memories. And I don't have any, I don't have any kids yet. And I don't know if I will. So uh, I think the stuff that I've parted with ended up in good hands. And I think you've probably learned from experiences. It's not a good idea anyway, to have too many Chucky dolls in your house, just in case. It's definitely not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if, you know, if just in case something bad happens, I think I'm uh, uniquely equipped to deal with it. I think you are. <laughs> I think so. So here's a question I ask every guest on the Sarah O'Connell show. Can you tell me a fun fact about you, something we may not know, a hobby, a party trick, something like that? Um, well, not everybody knows that I've been writing poetry since I was a child. Um, I own a recording studio in Clearwater, Florida. I have recorded hundreds of artists. I went to school for audio. Um, but I... I I would say that I do have the mind of a poet, uh, which is kind of a curse, honestly, because you're constantly looking for uh, ways to make something profound. Mm. Um, and that's exhausting, but uh, it feels like such a necessary part of your soul that like you can't not have that be important to you. Um, so I write poems. Uh, I write at least pieces of a poem every mm. single day. And so is it correct you've written four poetry books now? I've put out four poetry books, yeah. 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 And are you constantly writing or so there could be more in the future? 
Yeah, I'm compiling uh, the next one right now. Matter of fact, I have I have about I don't know 300 poems that I have to sort through and pick the ones that I like. I usually I usually put out collections of about 100 pages, and sometimes there's a couple on each page, or sometimes there's one that lasts a couple pages. Um, but once I once I go through my process of picking out what I want to be in it, um, and then coming up with the cover design and the title, which is always kind of a tricky thing. Um, yeah, the next next book will be out this year at some point. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. And so in addition to the, the Chucky franchise, you've also worked on things like Wait Until Spring Bandini, My Family Treasure, Dead Country, On the Rapes, South of Central. Which of these have been your favorites to work on? Um, Wait Until Spring Bandini was a really incredible experience. Uh, it was based on a, a great book. I, Joe Montagna played my father, a brilliant Italian actress, Renella Muti played my mother. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was super fun. I mean, I played Federico Bandini, a very poor Italian family, a uh, child from a very poor Italian family. Uh, and we shot it in Salt Lake City in between part one and part two. That was a really fun, fun thing. Um, yeah, that's the answer. That's the one. Love that. And so you you studied sound engineering and audio post production at Full Sail University. Was that something you always wanted to get into and you were sort of considering when you were growing up? Yeah. I'm a huge, huge music fan and I spent my childhood auditioning and I didn't really get great at an instrument. I played piano a little bit, but uh I wanted to get really good at making people sound their best. In my my studio in Clearwater, it's avproductionsonline.com. Uh, yeah, we've worked with a lot of a lot of really talented artists, um, and uh, yeah, it's 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 just it's any any opportunity I get to help creative people around me and be creative myself at the same time is something I'm going to jump at. I love that. And if people head over to your website, they can learn more about your audio work. Some of your poetry is on there as well, and there's links to buy the books and all that good stuff as well. And my website is alexvincentonline.com the studios is av productions but if they just go to alexvincentonline.com there's tabs to get you to everything that you would want to do or you could just go follow me on instagram at alex underscore vincent and go to the link in my bio because that link tree link has everything in my life uh through it it's very convenient i love those i've, I've added one myself recently it's great yeah, yeah. it's normally there's not enough space is there but now now we have it yeah yeah absolutely. Now your, your website also notes that you've worked on some screenplays i've written a few screenplays yep haven't found a way to sell any of them yet but uh uh, we made one really low budget down in in florida i have another one that i've been wanting to make for a while and i have about i don't know 40 screenplay ideas that i gotta find some time in my life to start working on some of them but uh yeah I, i i love to write that's really what i do most um the audio is super fun and, and I'm and I'm pretty good at it. The acting is super fun and I'm okay at it. Um, but the uh, writing is just, that's just running through my veins. I have to do things like that. Can you tell me what else you've got planned for 2022? I understand you might be busy for March onwards. I have a whole lot planned. You got to follow me on Instagram and you'll, you'll stay apprised of everything that I have going on between Instagram, Patreon, YouTube, Twitter. Uh, there's, there's all kinds of ways to follow me. I'll have a bunch of personal appearances, conventions, appearances all over the place. I'll be over in the UK. So my final question, have you got any messages for people watching the Sarah O'Connell show and your fans around the world? My fans around the world. I mean, my, I am, I am, you know, as a guy who's this been in his life, his entire life, um, I've, I've gotten incredibly kind uh, support and words and encouragement from all the Chucky fans. Um, so I'm internally grateful to them and I do my best to make them aware of that. And um, as far as the fans of your show, keep watching her because she works really hard. It's not easy to procure some of the interviews that you're able to get. Um, it's actually 
pretty damn impressive some of the people that you've gotten to sit down with you it's because you're tenacious and you're persistent um and very kind and uh and good things happen to people who work hard and and spread uh generosity of spirit and that's why you deserve the uh the success and the and the fun that you're having while doing it well that means the world to me thank you so much and thank you for a lifetime of entertainment i've loved your films since well i was the same age as you as a kid watching the original child's play and thank you so much for coming on my show today thank you so much i wish you all the best i'll see you next year looking forward to it and thank you to everybody watching at home be sure to share subscribe give this video a big thumbs up and leave lots of lovely comments and i'll see you all again soon for another episode of the sarah o'connell show bye Bye. Best subscribe to the Sarah O'Connell show. Otherwise, Chucky will kill you.